What is up, guys? Well, I have been home in Georgia for almost a week, and now it is finally time to sit down and talk about all 25 films that I saw at Fantastic Fest 2024. Now, Fantastic Fest is a film festival that is held in Austin, Texas at an Alamo Drafthouse location. It's a genre film festival, so you get horror, you get action, you get sci-fi, drama, a lot of foreign films, a lot of weird stuff in between. It is not a boring film festival whatsoever. It is something where even on the lower end of your list of films, usually there's something very distinct and interesting about those films that make them stand out, even if they're your least favorite. Now, I've been covering and attending this festival for the last three years. It always is a good time, but this year especially had a lot of really standout cool things that made it a really fun experience. So I want to open the video talking about my festival experience and some of the things that I did, some of the people that I met, some of the wild things that happened. But if you want to just go ahead and skip to the ranking of the 25 films that I saw, there will be chapter markers on the little drag bar, so you can go ahead and skip towards whatever you want to check check out. But before I even get to the festival itself, my time in Texas started in the wildest possible way because a few weeks back, almost a month ago now, I got an email from Blasco, who is the bass player for Rob Zombie. He was also previously the bass player for Ozzy Osbourne, reaching out saying that he's a fan of my channel and wanted to know if I wanted to come out and attend one of their shows, come backstage, hang out, meet each other. And while I initially thought it might be fake because who would expect that crazy shit to happen, turned out to be true. And so me, Uncle Sean, T.O. Rudy, and even Kanan from uh, Ghost Pirate Entertainment flew out to Dallas, Texas. And we all checked out the final tour date of the Freaks on Parade tour, which was Rob Zombie, Alice Cooper, Ministry, and Filter was supposed to play. But the last two shows, I guess the one of the band members was sick, so they bowed out. And so we attended this concert, rocked out all night, and hung out backstage with Blasco, his wonderful wife Carol, the guitar player of Rob Zombie, and even Joseph Bashara was there hanging out, which we didn't notice who he was at first, which was the craziest thing. And he's actually the composer for a lot of James Wan films, including The Conjuring, I think all of the Insidious films, or at least most of them. And he's actually the person who plays the lipstick face demon. So that was just a wild night. Like, I loved meeting these guys. I loved hanging out. If I had any disappointment, it's that we didn't get to hang out long enough. We're talking movies. We're talking YouTube. We're talking music. I'm asking Blasco, like, does it piss you off when people watch your shows through their cell phone? Because it pisses me off. The show itself was incredible. I have now seen Rob Zombie three times. I've seen Alice Cooper five times. He was actually my first concert when I was 10 years old. And I'm not bullshitting when I tell you that when we saw them in Dallas, I think it was the best that I've seen both of those bands play. And so that night in and of itself is almost worthy of its own video because it's literally a night that I will never forget. It's one of the coolest experiences I've ever had in my life. And uh, I really hope that sometime down the road, hopefully sooner than later, I can hook up with Blasco and Carol and all them again and watch a show and hang out even more because they were just awesome people. Very generous to to invite us along and hang out with us and uh, you know squeeze us into the 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 fan op line and get us a picture with Rob and with Blasco like just a unforgettable night to kick off my time in Texas before this crazy ass festival even started. And then you fast forward a day and the Fantastic Fest festival starts and we start off with a bang because me and Sean signed up to do the red carpet for day one, which was going to be the rule of Jenny Penn, which is the opening film of the festival. Uh, Never Let Go, which is the Alexander Aja film and Halle Berry was going to be in attendance. And then, of course, and predominantly the reason why I wanted to sign up for it, Terrifier 3, which damn near everybody involved with that film was going to be there on the red carpet. And so uh, while I was initially nervous and had a little bit of jitters because I'm not used to interviewing and doing red carpet stuff, got to interview Halle Berry. And even though my heart was pounding out of its chest for a variety of reasons, that was awesome. That was a great experience meeting somebody that I've been a fan of my entire life. And then, of course, when the Terrifier 3 crew came out, I mean, it was just the most amazing way to start off this experience because you know you never expect when you do what I do that people that actually work in the industry take notice or they remember you even if you meet them like you just I'm humble enough that I never expect that I'm that memorable of a person and so whenever 
Damien Leon comes out and starts to do the, the photography side, which is how they set it up. The, the stars come out. They do all the professional photography one by one, then a group shot. And then all the press people come up and do all the interview questions. He comes out. They start snapping their pictures and he literally stops the photography and runs over to me and Sean. It's like, dude, I'm so glad you guys are here. I like I love that you're here and shook our hands and was all excited. And we were like. That's a good way to start. Holy shit. Damien knows us and is excited we're here. That's fucking cool. And so that put me on cloud nine and of itself. And then after they get done with their photos, we go over and me and Sean briefly interviewed Damien. We were running short on time. I would have loved to ask more questions, but we just had one brief question each. And then as if that wasn't awesome enough already, I turn around after I finished my brief interview with Damien and Lauren Lavera is right there waiting and gives me a big hug and is excited to meet me. And I'm thrilled to meet her finally. All right. Oh. Yo, How Dennis, you doing? nice to meet you in person. Yes, absolutely. What's going on? First red, well, second red carpet, technically. Oh, really? So I'm kind of getting used to the whole vibe here. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, you it's look pretty great. cool. Thank I love you. the shirt. So do you. you yeah, really I had a couple of designs and I was like, what? I'd be stupid not to wear this, this tonight. Appropriate. Yes. This is really appropriate. Absolutely. Are you from here, Eddie? No, I'm oh, from Georgia, you? actually. So I flew out uh, a couple days ago. Oh, nice. We uh, went to Wait, Rob Zombie and Alice Cooper last night. The oh, bassist is a fan of my channel. No. So he's like, come backstage. And I was like, Absolutely. And you're like, yeah, yeah. okay. That sounds amazing. Oh, yeah. dude, that's so fucking cool. I'm happy yeah, for you. So awesome. I'm happy yes, you made it so here. Awesome. Yes, me too. Were you here last too. year too? Or the... I was here the last two years. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. So I was here for Terrifier too, but you weren't. Yeah, I wasn't. I was like, oh, bummer. I know I wasn't. I saw that you were there, but yeah. no, I'm happy to be here now. I'm yeah. excited for that. It's going to be fun. It's yeah, a yeah, cool yeah. festival. I'm so, excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. She was wonderful to meet. Uh, again, wish I would have had more time to talk with her, but it was a very busy convention, a very busy red carpet. So got a brief question. We talked about the Rob Zombie concert and a few other things really quick. I saw her a couple more times before the actual Terrifier 3 premiere. So we got to chat a little briefly here and there. And uh, then, of course, at, after the premiere, I hung out after the movie was done. And everybody was funneling out of the theater and talk with them all a little bit more again. But those two days back to back could have been the entire trip for me. And I would have said this is like one of the greatest trips of my life. I just absolutely loved meeting these people. And one thing that I will say about the Terrifier crew specifically, and I sent Michael Levy, who is the one of the producers, and he's also the director of stream. And I got a chance to meet him too. And that was awesome after Terrifier 3 funneled out at three in the morning. Uh, so we were both very tired, but still had a really great conversation. I sent him a message echoing the same sentiment. They are some of the coolest and most down-to-earth people I have ever interacted with in the movie industry. A lot of times when you do what I do, and the people that do take notice of you, a lot of times, more times than not, unfortunately, that relationship feels very transactional. It feels like you're only as valuable to them for how much promotion you can give or how much of a good review you give their stuff. And if you give them a bad review or if you don't promote their stuff or if whatever suddenly it doesn't matter. You're, you're not worth talking to. And I've had experiences all in that spectrum. But the people involved with Terrifier, everybody that I have interacted with involved with Terrifier is like the exact opposite of that. They literally are just like horror fans that just happen to have this massively successful franchise. And they're there having just as much fun talking with us as we are talking with them. And we're just like all a bunch of horror fans sitting down to watch a gore fest. And that's just such a cool experience. So if you ever get the chance, whether it's a convention, a festival, anywhere else, to meet and interact with anybody involved with those films, you're in for a treat because they're just such cool, awesome people. And it's those types of people that I genuinely want to support and champion and cheer on as much as I possibly can. Those are the people that I want to see succeed. Those are the people that I want to see get everything that they uh, that they dream for, everything that they have strived towards for their career. And, you know, hopefully I enjoy the films along the way. Otherwise, it gets awkward. But luckily, I have enjoyed Terrifier 2 and Terrifier 3 quite a bit. And so I, I just really loved meeting all of them. I wish I could have got a chance to meet more of them and talk with more of them. But uh, yeah, that those two days back and forth, the Rob Zombie experience and the uh, first day of Fantastic Fest, especially meeting the Terrifier crew was just like the highlight of the entire trip. And the last thing that I will absolutely value this experience of Fantastic Fest this year more than anything else up to this point is that I met so many awesome people. Now, I always end up running into subscribers or running into fellow creators that watch my channel or I recognize their channel or whatever at these types of events. But 
more than the other two years combined. And you can even throw in Overlook in there, more than those three festival experiences combined. This year was just jam-packed, full of awesome experiences, meeting people, meeting fellow creators, meeting uh, even friends that I had met in previous festivals that I got a chance to see again, as well as meeting new friends, meeting subscribers and fans of the channel, meeting other creators within completely different spaces of YouTube that have come out because they've seen me or Sean's coverage of the festival. I mean, I could name off names all day. I mean, you got Chuck, uh, your, your movie guy. You got Sydney from Horror Chronicles. Of course, my buddy Seth from According to Seth. You got Justin from Slasher Talk. You've got Eli, Gigi from Room for Scream, who I met at Overlook. And uh, her and Justin from Slasher Talk, me and Sean actually went around and did like a little Texas Chainsaw uh, tour and saw people committing felonies and <laughs> literally trespassing on the remake house, which was just another wild story to end things off with. Lane from Deep Red Perfect Blue, Colby Does Horror, Brian Fears Ghosts, uh, you had Austin and Carissa, who were a couple of more fitness YouTubers and TikTokers that came up that were awesome. We hung out with them basically the entire second half of the festival. So many awesome people. And if I leave you out, I apologize. I'm just talking about a lot. Everybody that I met at this festival was just a wonderful experience. I value all of you as friends, as followers as people that I can attend festivals with and just geek out with movies about. So I just wanted to put a section in this video to talk about that. You know, a lot of people are going to skip to the ranking. They want to talk about the movies, but that's what I'm going to value this experience the most for is just meeting cool people, having awesome experiences that go beyond the collection of movies that I saw. And by the way, pretty much everybody that I just named, if they have a YouTube channel, a TikTok channel, I'll put a link down below. If you guys are interested, you can check out all their channels, subscribe to the ones that you like. Uncle Sean dropped his Fantastic Fest ranking, which I encourage you to check out, and I'll put a link up here for that. Not only so you can see how his list differs from mine, but also because Sean does a much better job than I do at getting snippets of all of these people talking about the festival, their favorite film, so you can get a little bit of a taste of who all these people are. And I encourage you to check all of them out because they're all awesome. Now, before we get into the ranking, the last thing that I need to cover in regards to my experience at Fantastic Fest, because I do think that this is important to put out there, especially with the platform that I have. I absolutely love my experience of going to this festival for the three years that I have gone. And this year in particular, I would say I easily had the best experience that I have had yet in the three years that I have attended. Part of that's because of all of the cool stuff I just talked about. A large part of that's because of the people and the experiences that I had, the memories that I made. It was also a fairly solid slate of films that I saw. There weren't nearly as many competing for my top, but there weren't also as many competing for my bottom. There were a lot of them, the majority of my list that are in that like three to 3.75 out of five range where I'm like, it's good. It was worth checking out. But the largest part of why I had a great experience is purely luck. The Fantastic Fest ticketing gods smiled down upon me this year, as opposed to last year where they took a giant shit on me for more than half of the festival. The ticketing system that Fantastic Fest uses absolutely needs to be updated. It needs to be tinkered with. It needs to be fine-tuned. There need to be some changes made. Essentially, what you do is that you log into this app or you can log into the website on a laptop and at 10 a.m. sharp every morning, typically a minute or two early, the ticketing goes live and everybody, aside from the people that paid for the higher end badges that could choose their tickets a week or two prior, are basically battling it out to get to the movies and the showings and the specific theaters that they want. And the last two years in a row, it has been an absolute bloodbath shit show because the website starts to crash and you get these little loading circles and then the website fixes and all of a sudden the majority of things are sold out. And so it is absolutely up to luck, timing and chance on whether or not you see the movies that you want to see. And they used to have this verbiage when you bought a ticket or you bought a pass that said you are guaranteed a movie in every time slot. You're not necessarily guaranteed for your favorite, but you will see a movie in every time slot. They have since removed that verbiage because the last two years they have seemingly oversold badges and they have caught, they have way overdone the amount of films that this theater can sustain, making some of the bigger films have less theaters available. And so they can't promise that anymore without getting into some kind of legal issue. And it just really sucked 
to see a number of people, not just one or two, a number of people that I know and was hanging out with the entire eight days literally go multiple days without being able to see a single film. That's unacceptable. You know, I personally didn't have that experience, but I can't fully enjoy that when I know a number of my friends really got screwed on a couple of days where they are paying for the travel to get there. They are paying for their food. They're paying for housing while they're there. And they're there to cover things for their job, for their work. And they're not able to because of this ticketing fiasco. And as somebody that has run into multiple people over the last two years, most of which this year, that walked up to me and said, I'm only here because you did a video saying how awesome this festival is and I had to check it out. If I'm going to have that level of influence, I want to be completely transparent about the issues that you might have if you attend this festival, if they don't fix the ticketing system. It's a wonderful festival. It's run by really cool people. I can't imagine the amount of work and organization that goes into it. And the fact that it goes off as well as it does is still a marvel to me, despite the issues. But that has to be addressed. I hated the experience that I had with the ticketing last year. And this year, it was the only thing that everybody could talk about in the first couple of days leading up to it is, I hope the ticketing is better. And it wasn't. It was worse. And so I've already decided I'm not going to rely on my press badge anymore, which I get for free if you get approved. I'm going to buy one of the higher end badges so that I can secure all the showings that I want a week or two ahead of time and just take the stress out of all of it. Because it really sucks waking up at 930 in the morning and spending from 9.45 till 10 a.m. with a laptop and a cell phone open, just refreshing until things open and then doing a mad dash and either oh, breathing a sigh of relief or getting instantly pissed and setting your day off on a sour note because you got locked out of something that you really wanted or really needed to see to justify financially this trip. So I don't know if anybody involved with Fantastic Fest or anybody would, would watch this video if they do. You guys do a fantastic job, but that has to be addressed. Two years in a row now, that's been the biggest thing that people are talking about outside of the theater is how horrific this ticketing system is and how much it's souring their experience. That's got to be addressed or people are going to stop attending. Now, with all of that being said, and hopefully that's not too long of an intro for this video, but it's things that I absolutely wanted to include. Let's talk about the movies, shall we? So I was able to check out 24 films at this festival, and one of these movies actually played at the festival, and I was able to see a day or two later. So I'm going to include it since it was one of the movies on their roster. So 25 films. And something that's important to note is that there's no movies on this list, maybe save for one that I just think are bad films. Like, I think all of these have their merit. I think all of these have an audience that would love them. The ones towards the bottom are simply just movies that didn't work for me for one reason or another. But I encourage you, if it sounds interesting, if it looks interesting, if it catches your eye, to check it out because you might have a better experience than I did. Coming in at number 25 is going to be a film called Sister Midnight. And to be completely transparent, I did not want to see this film. I was not interested in seeing this film, but this was the only movie that we could get access to for this time slot because of the ticketing error and because I needed to get there early to check something with the PR people. And so rather than go home, we just stayed and watched a film. Now, Sister Midnight, I believe, is a UK-based film, but it takes place in India. And it's essentially telling the story of this woman who has just gotten married, uh, I believe, for an arranged marriage. And it really starts off as her kind of just rebelling against cultural norms in India and cultural norms for what the duties of a wife is supposed to be. And then it kind of slowly changes into some other things. I wouldn't really call it a horror film, but some of the directions, it kind of, it dips its toe into some horror directions. And I can't give specificity without spoiling where things go. It was, it had some interesting ideas, but the issue is the movie is extremely slow and it really doesn't have any perceived forward momentum. At no point in the movie, all the way to the end, does it really feel like we're building towards something. At no point watching this did I feel like I had an idea of where this story is taking me. And not like in a subverting expectations or a surprising way, just in a what are we doing here? Like what what is the point? What is the plot? What is the conflict we're trying to resolve? I never got a grasp for that the entire way through. So it's a film that a lot of people loved. If I'm not mistaken, it actually won one of the audience awards at Fantastic Fest. So clearly I'm kind of in the minority. 
But this one for being an early morning film, first of all, was just way too slow for the amount of stuff they had to actually show on screen. And I just wish they had done something in the first or second act to kind of set up where we were going. It just kind of felt rudderless. It felt like we were just directionless, just watching things happen. Number 24 is Megalopolis. And this is the one film I did not see at the actual festival. I watched it at a theater after I arrived back home in Georgia, but they did add this last minute as a film that was going to premiere at this festival. Unfortunately, they scheduled it alongside one of the secret screenings and there was no way I was going to choose Megalopolis over the potential of what the secret screening could be. And so I had no interest in this film, just to be completely transparent. I was not really interested in any of the early controversy and buzz surrounding it. Uh, I'd never watched the trailer for it, but the little bit that I heard about it didn't sound intriguing to me. And this is a movie that feels like Francis Ford Coppola self-funded it and made it for himself. And I can respect that. I don't understand exactly what his drive for this was. I don't understand what his passion for this idea was. I certainly don't understand if he ever had any inkling thinking this was going to be a profitable idea, which kind of leans on the foolish side for me. You sell a winery, you fund this with 100 million of your own money, you release it to a bunch of controversy and a bunch of what the fuck reactions like, I don't know, doesn't make sense to me. I have heard from a couple of people that they like this, they appreciate this. My buddy Joey Sasso actually texted us mid-festival and said, Megalopolis is the most important film in American cinema of the last 10 years. Which might sound crazy, but if you know Joey, it is the most Joey possible thing he could have said about Megalopolis. So this works for some people. I am not one of those people. I think there was things to appreciate about it. I think that there was a couple of the performances that were fun. It's certainly... It's not boring with all the weird, wacky ideas it throws in that don't really feel like they fit together. But uh, yeah, it, it's a movie that feels like it's only made for Francis Ford Coppola. And uh, I am not Francis Ford Coppola, so didn't work for me. Coming in at number 23 is a film that is either going to be called Sunset Superman or Don't Mess With Grandma. Now, the director says this is Sunset Superman. That is the title that I crafted this film for. It's the title that's going to be in the title card. The Dio song Sunset Superman is going to be a needle drop in the movie. It fits what I was going for with this. But when Tubi bought it for distribution, they hated the title and they wanted to change it to Don't Mess With Grandma. So I don't know what title this movie is going to have when it does get released. I personally think Sunset Superman's a better title for the film that I saw. But nonetheless, this is a movie that we walked into strictly because it was a action comedy starring Michael Jai White. And I like Michael Jai White. I think that he's a cool dude. I think he's a good actor. I think that he's a very uh, capable martial artist, of course. So when I hear action comedy starring Michael Jai White about him trying to protect his grandma from some home invaders... That sounded like the perfect recipe of stupid, awesome action that I needed at this point in the festival. And I did not enjoy this whatsoever. This is a movie that feels like if they had even just maybe 500 grand more could have been a really interesting thing. But it feels so cheap. It feels so unbelievably restricted by the budget and honestly, for Michael Jai White being the selling point for me, I feel like his role could have been played by anybody because his martial arts skills and his ability to, you know, be a convincing and capable martial arts character kicking ass in a movie like this is not utilized whatsoever. Like there's no martial arts at play here. He punches a few dudes. He grabs a few people. He throws them outside. There's a lot of like a slapstick nature to the fights and to the, you know, the, the, the robbers getting injured. It's not really what I would call an action film. Like there's no action here. There's just some very low budget and low choreographed fights. And even the humor that the film has, I think I might have laughed once, maybe twice, chuckled. Uh, the people in my theater were rolling, which is one of the weird things about festival crowds. Like sometimes it can be infectious and you can love a movie even more with a crowd like that. And sometimes it's like off putting where they were laughing so hard at things where I'm like, really? That fucking killed for you? OK, so, yeah, this movie felt like it was easily going to be in my top 10 if they just delivered on the premise and what I was assuming this was going to be. And it was just it was a very cheap uneffective version of what I hoped it would be. So I can't recommend this one. Number 22 is a film called Gazer. And this was essentially sold as kind of a throwback to 70s noir in the vein of Taxi Driver. And I think 
that selling point on the little leaflet that we had kind of set up my expectations incorrectly for this film. If I was to compare this to another film, it would not be Taxi Driver, even though it does have that 70s kind of low res quality to it. That's early Scorsese ish narratively pacing wise and tonally. I think this has more in common with Christopher Nolan's following which is not necessarily a favorite of my films of his. You know, it, it's basically a student film. It is, it's great for what it is, but not a movie I would ever rewatch. And Gazer could be along those lines as something that shows future talent for this filmmaker, for this actress and things to come. But in and of itself, it's a very slow burn movie. And it, it just really struggled to hold my attention because it just took a really deliberately long time to really move the plot forward. You essentially have this character that has some kind of a mental deterioration, some kind of a, a mental disability where she can kind of just nod off and lose chunks of time. She has like a tape recorder that she listens to herself and kind of gives herself instructions to like pay attention to details around her and like fucking count the street lights and do things to like stay in the moment so that she doesn't black out and an hour's gone. And this person ends up kind of getting entangled in a murder mystery. Now, that's an interesting premise, but so much of the film is spent on just her kind of wandering around, navigating this mental disability more so than it is on any interesting details regarding this murder. Now, there's some twists and some turns that made it kind of start to perk up a little bit, start to get my interest, but it just never really felt like it kicked into second gear. And so by the end of it, it's a movie that I can absolutely see the audience for this. I could see people valuing this and saying, we got to keep our eye on this filmmaker. I love what this does. For me, it just struggled to hold my attention. And unfortunately, it was placed in a segment of this festival where I had like five super slow films in a row. So I'll be honest, that might have knocked it down a couple of places just for that reason alone, just because I, I, I was kind of exhausted with slow burn movies by that point. But you know, talent on display, not a story that particularly drove my interest or that I would want to revisit a whole lot, but certainly interesting enough to recommend to those of you that like films like this. Conan at 21 is going to be a movie called The Little Bites, and this is written and directed by Spider One, who is the front man for Power Man 5000 and oddly enough, Rob Zombie's brother. So it was kind of a running joke for the days leading up to this first screening of this film of, for between me and Sean, like, hey, I guess we're going to meet the whole zombie family this week. And so uh, this film essentially has this woman who lives in her house by herself, and there is a vampire of sorts in her basement that slowly feeds off of her. And so the story of the film is her trying to navigate a way to get out of whatever this deal or relationship she has with this vampire, while also trying to find a way to get her daughter back into her custody, which she obviously can't do with a monster in the basement which is a really interesting premise. I think that the performances are really good. I think that the makeup effects and especially the performance on the vampiric character was really good. But this movie absolutely failed to make its point for me. It's very clearly something that's trying to be an allegory or some kind of a commentary on something. The most easy explanation I could give is like a toxic relationship, somebody who the toxic member of the relationship is literally taking little bites out of this person figuratively. And they just show you the literal version of it here. But it never finds an effective way, especially with the ending that I did not like at all, to merge the surface level story with the commentary. Like when you're going to do something like that, that's allegorical, you have to find a way to merge those two things together where it all kind of comes together and is copacetic. And I don't feel like they did a good job at that, to the point where when the ending happened, me and Robert, who I was sitting next to, uh, who also has a YouTube channel, by the way, that I'll put a link down to below. I forgot to name him earlier. We literally looked at each other and we're just like, what the fuck does that mean? And so, uh, yeah, th this one, it was... It was interesting. It certainly had some tense moments. I like the performances, and I think that uh, there's a lot of people that will dig what it's going for. But if you're going to be a metaphoric storyteller, you're walking a tightrope. You have to execute that in a very careful way. And I just feel like they absolutely fumbled that in the third act. They never brought those stories together and left too many questions unanswered. Like, I still don't understand 
how this vampire came into the situation, how the main character got involved with it. Like there were so many question marks that it just, it failed to really make its point with me. Number 20 is actually the second secret screening of five. And that was The Apprentice. This is the Donald Trump film starring Sebastian Stan. And I'm going to try my best to walk a tightrope in talking about this film. I wish I didn't have to include it, but is it a well-made film overall? Yes. I think that they do a commendable job at kind of capturing the different eras that they're going for here, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and forward. I think that Sebastian Stan does an incredible job as Donald Trump and kind of capturing his mannerisms and his shtick throughout the eras as well. Like the first chunk of the movie, I'm like, yeah, like, he's doing a decent job as Donald Trump. Like it's kind of all in the lips that he's doing. And then as the movie progresses on, you start to get a lot more Trumpisms and you start to get a lot more of the dialect and the mannerisms and the way that he conveys himself that matches much more of what we know Trump to be today. And so I thought that was an incredible performance. So nothing but hats off to him. I do think that there is an interesting story to be told about Donald Trump, whether you hate the guy or love the guy or somewhere in between He's one of the most fascinating people that has ever walked the fucking earth. Like his story is fascinating. And so you could tell a really interesting story that is unbiased about this guy. And I would be really interested in hearing and seeing that story because he's just a fascinating dude. No matter how you cut it, he's fascinating as a human being. But the problem is this movie is so blatantly and obviously and overtly made by people who despise Donald Trump. This is a classic American horror story. <laughs> I am not a fan of Donald Trump. Let me state that clearly. There's plenty of reasons to take issue with the man. But I'm one of those people that I don't fucking like when Hollywood is trying to influence my voting or trying to get me to think their way. Because... 99% of the time, it is so fucking biased and it is so overtly dishonest in the way that they convey their message that it just turns me off. And so I just don't understand what the point of this movie is. People that hate Donald Trump are going to continue to hate Donald Trump, whether they see this movie or not. People that love Donald Trump are going to continue to love Donald Trump, and they're going to consider this movie like hateful propaganda and a bunch of lies spewed by Hollywood. And then you got the majority of people in the middle that don't think that he's Hitler, but don't necessarily like the guy either, that are going to see this movie and hear what it's going for and are immediately going to be turned off from it. So you have a movie here that literally treats Donald Trump like Scarface. He is just a regular dude who's got a rich dad, and then he gets involved with this lawyer who is like the devil on his shoulder and turns him into Donald Trump. Like there's literally lines in the movie in the first act where this lawyer is teaching Donald Trump about how to convey himself and it's just so on the nose that it gives me a headache. It's like rule number one, attack, attack, attack. Rule number two, take accountability for absolutely nothing. Rule number three, never accept defeat. Even if you lose, say you win. You hear that and you're like, hmm, I wonder if there's an agenda here. And as the movie goes on, they just continue to ratchet up how horrible of a person that he is which he might be, but coming through the lens of Hollywood, it just comes across as exaggerated and dishonest. Like Donald Trump might be on this level of shitbag person, but Hollywood's going to make it be up here. It's like if somebody made a Cody Leach biopic and the director is somebody on Reddit that thinks that I'm the biggest piece of shit on YouTube. Would you really think that there's a lot of honesty in that movie or do you think maybe things are a bit skewed? And so really it's down on this list just because it's a subject matter, it's a person, it's, it's a theme of something that I just don't want to talk about, I don't want to think about, I don't want to spend two hours in a movie theater talking and hearing about it. I go to this festival to have fun and when you sneak in a politically charged hit piece movie, whether it's true or false, a few weeks before an election, I... I don't fucking want to be there. If this was not a secret screening, I would not have chosen to watch this film. But I did, and here's where it lands.
Number 19 is going to be the first three episodes of The Creep Tapes. This is a continuation of the Netflix Creep films, and it's going to be, I believe, a six-episode series that's going to drop on Shudder. Now, obviously, this is a very odd placement in this list because I'm ranking three episodes of a TV series versus a bunch of movies, but this was a screening at the festival, so I'm going to include it. This was the fifth and final secret screening of the festival, and... While this is obviously not my least favorite thing that I saw at the festival, this was by far the most disappointing screening that I had for the entire eight days. Because at this point, with the four secret screenings behind us that we had already known what they were going to be, we had only had one horror film. And so there was a lot of speculation basically all throughout the next couple of days about like, is it going to be Smile 2? Is it going to be Nosferatu? Is it going to be The Wolfman? Is it going to be something else wild? And even though I had very little confidence it was actually going to be this, my biggest hope was Lee Winnell's Wolfman, because how awesome would it be to be able to check that film out months in advance, cover it months in advance. And it wasn't that far out of the realm of possibility because they had completed it and they had pushed it to January. It was originally supposed to come out uh, this month, I believe. So I had an inkling of hope of that. And so, as I always do, I put my phone up and I record the reveal of what the secret screening is, and me and Sean are all the way in the back at the very top row in the stadium seating, so we can only really see a little bit and what we zoom in to see, and you have somebody come out wearing a wolf mask, and both of us are like, <gasps> and you can hear my reaction go from extreme excitement to extreme disappointment. Oh! Mark Duplass and Patrick Bryce here oh. to present three episodes of The Creep Tapes. Oh. Son of a bitch. Yes! 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 No! 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 Fuck! And so then they reveal, yeah, this is actually Mark Duplass. He's wearing the, I believe they call it Peach Fuzz mask, which Creep fans would recognize. Uh, I might have recognized it if I was closer, but all I saw was a wolf mask. And I'm thinking, oh my God, really? It's it. This is fucking awesome. And then it ends up being, you know, three episodes of a TV show that I had no interest in. Now, there were a lot of people there that love the Creep movies that absolutely love this. So if you're somebody that really enjoys those two films, I think this is something that's really going to be enjoyable for you. I think you're going to be a fan of it. What I will say as somebody who... I don't dislike the two creep films, but they're not really my thing. I'm not a big found footage guy. And while I think Mark Duplass is great with what he's doing with this character, both of those films felt like that didn't really sustain my attention for 90 minutes. So with that said, what I will say to commend this version, which is a uh, little 25 minute episodes, is that I think that this concept works better in that format. I think that each episode detailing him pursuing one specific victim actually works better than a whole 90 minute film based around that that whole premise. So with that being said, I, I was slightly impressed by the creep tapes for that alone, but it's still not really my thing. And of the three episodes that we saw, I thought two of them were pretty decent. I thought one of them was awful. And so it, it was fine. Like I wasn't like mad that I saw this. I was certainly disappointed because of it being a secret screening and seeing a TV series and, you know, just a couple of episodes and not even the complete season of a TV series at a film festival is not something I'm particularly interested in. So if I had known what this was, I certainly would have watched something else uh, that added in with the whole Wolfman dick tease. It was a very disappointing experience. But if I was to grade this fairly, I, I probably appreciated these more than the two movies. So those of you guys that love the movies, you might really love this just wasn't something I was in the mood for. Coming in at 18 is a movie called House of Spoils, and I was really hoping this was going to continue the trend of Fantastic Fest having awesome restaurant slash foodie themed films, because two years ago we got The Menu, which was one of my favorite films of the year and was my favorite film of the festival. Last year, even though I missed it at the festival, I caught it this year in uh, What You Wish For, starring Nick Stahl, which inevitably would have been in my top four or five films of last year's festival. And so this was the foodie horror flick this year. And this one didn't quite land for me. I do think that there's people that are going to enjoy it, but I just... 
it, it, the mix of what they were going for didn't completely come together. What you basically have here is you have a movie that's kind of going for the restaurant chaos and tension of FX's The Bear mixed in with witch stuff. So you have this chef that has endured the fine dining experience working in a prestigious kitchen and all of the chaos that ensues with that. She goes off on her own and partners up with a guy who has purchased this really old decrepit building in the middle of like the swamps. It looks like maybe like Louisiana or something. I could be getting the area wrong, but very swampy, <laughs> you know, very New Orleans esque in its look. And they're going to open up their own restaurant. And unbeknownst to them, this building and this land is kind of cursed by this witch. And so anything that they try to cook that does not use produce or ingredients that are birthed on this cursed land that are not from crops on this land, it turns to shit, literally and figuratively. And so you essentially have this corruption plot line where this chef that's trying to make a name for herself, trying to break out on her own, is forced to use these corrupting materials in order to succeed. And is it really her skills as a chef that is succeeding or is it just the powers of suggestion that is involved with these these cursed produce items and cursed meats and everything that is actually the star of the show? which could have been a really interesting premise. But for me, I didn't feel like the foodie side of things, the restaurant drama side of things was as engaging as I would have liked it to be. And I didn't find really any of the characters to be all that likable involved with it. That's one of the things that makes the bear so successful is that it's such a toxic, ridiculous, stressful env environment, but it's filled with characters that you like. And I just didn't feel like they got that mix right in this. And then when you get into the horror side of things, there's just not enough of it. Like the whole movie goes for probably a good 45 minutes to an hour before anything spooky or witch themed really starts to show its head. If it wasn't for the cold open of the film, you wouldn't even know this is a horror film until the third act. And so even when the third act comes, it just didn't really ever ramp into enough horror for my tastes. So it's kind of a half measure when I would have preferred, I would have appreciated a full measure here. I think people will enjoy it though. It's a, it's coming to Hulu very shortly, I believe. So check it out if you like witch stuff, if you like foodie stuff. But for me, while it was enjoyable enough, while it was good enough for me to recommend, I just wish it would have had more oomph to it. Coming in at 17 is the opening film of the festival, and that is The Rule of Jenny Penn. And I knew absolutely nothing about this film. In fact, pretty much every film on this list I knew nothing about. I didn't watch trailers. I barely looked at the premise. So aside from maybe two or three of the more mainstream movies that I had seen a trailer for, a lot of these I walked in and just experienced the film in the way that it was meant to be. And The Rule of Jenny Penn is essentially a face-off movie between Jeffrey Rush and John Lithgow, two actors that I love, especially John Lithgow, one of my favorites of all time. And what you have here is Jeffrey Rush is this very hardened judge that has like a stroke and ends up in an assisted living facility. And as he is there, he comes to meet John Lithgow, who is somebody who is very evil and nefarious, and he torments tortures and literally kills other attendees, other patients in this assisted living facility and torments them with this little hand puppet called Jenny Penn. And so the movie is him trying to get people that work at this facility, the doctors, the nurses to notice what is happening. And when none of them come to his aid, he's battling not only his debilitating mental state, but he's battling John Lithgow and trying to figure out a way to survive and potentially stop him from his reign of terror. And the way that I just described it is way more interesting than what the movie actually is. Uh, I think that it is absolutely saved by the two lead performances. I think both of them are phenomenal, especially John Lithgow. He always plays an awesome villain. He's going for something that's very akin to like his performance in uh, Raising Cain, the Brian De Palma film here. So just to give you a flavor of what he's going for. And so there's a good chunk of the movie that you're just entertained watching these two Hollywood titans facing off against each other in a battle of wills. But the movie feels like there's only enough story here to sustain about a 45 minute film. And then after that, it just kind of feels like multiple ending syndrome. It feels like it just continues to go on. It continues to stretch past its natural point. And so it's a film that ultimately felt like 
I was intrigued. I was invested just because of the performers, but the story lost me at a certain point. And so it is interesting. I would recommend checking it out if you're a fan of either or both of those two actors. There is you know, some good filmmaking at play here. I just wish that there was more going on in the story to sustain a full length movie than what we actually got. Number 16 is going to be VHS Beyond. Now, I have not seen every VHS film. I think there's like two, maybe three of them that I have still yet to see. But my experience with all of them is basically the same. There's usually one segment that I love. There's two that I kind of like. And then the other half of them I don't like at all. And so there's never been a VHS film that overall I could tell you I enjoyed. Until this one. I think this is easily the best VHS film that I have seen yet. Now, it's still low on this list because found footage anthologies just aren't really my thing, and I would never rewatch this, and I never really get excited for VHS films. It's just kind of a Fantastic Fest staple at this point, so I watch it more so as like a tradition thing than, a, than an actual passion for what's going on here. But with this one, you have six different segments here. I thought the first four we're all pretty awesome. You have one that's very much like a body cam play on like Resident Evil almost. You have one that's like an Indian take on this AI gone mad. You have one that was uh, skydivers that are getting ready to jump out of a plane on a UFO shows up that goes nuts. And then you have one that is very much reminiscent of the movie Tusk. And so those four completely held my attention and I was like damn this one's actually a fucking banger and then we got the last two and to be fair I was very tired at this point so I would I would not take everything that I'm saying without a grain of salt um, so the last two one of them was just kind of a bookend piece and one of them was the debut directorial effort from Kate Siegel who is Mike Flanagan's wife and I think he also wrote this segment and it was just an odd placement for me because it's a significantly slower short than the other four. It felt odd to have these four very frantic, fast paced balls to the wall segments and then you end on the slower ones. And so I actually started to fall asleep a bit. It's very low res. It's all dialogue based. So I really don't want to say too much about it. I didn't enjoy it at the time just because I was tired and I felt like it was an odd placement within the movie, but I heard a lot of other people say it was very good. So check it out. I don't want to say anything disparaging about it because I just did it. I had a skewed experience, but this is the best experience that I've had with a VHS film yet. This is one that I actually wouldn't mind rewatching. I don't know if I will, but I wouldn't mind it if somebody wanted to pop it in. And I thought it was very fun and entertaining and just batshit wild for the majority of it. So if you're a fan of VHS, this would probably be much higher on your list. Number 15 is going to be Apartment 7A, and this is the Rosemary's Baby prequel that is currently out on Paramount+. Plus. And I didn't have very high expectations for this for a number of reasons. One, I was, you know, I was not a fan of Rosemary's Baby at all because I had never seen it, and so I didn't have any hype to be built with that. I watched it two days ago, or two days before the festival started for the first time. Did enjoy the film. I don't think it's something I'd rewatch, but I get why it's a classic. Uh, but also, it's a Paramount Plus prequel to a horror classic that they, when you walk into the theater, they they give you like a little swag bag. And the last time that happened, it was Pet Cemetery Bloodlines, and I did not enjoy that film at all. So I walked in, and it was like, oh, God, this is this is feeling very familiar. Uh, it's cool to get swag bags, but more times than not, it almost feels like they're greasing your palms a little bit. Like, please be kind to our film. Here's a free cookie and some socks. And so I just did not expect this thing to be good at all. And to be fair, way better than I thought it was going to be. It's actually solid. It's very competently made. Uh, I could see a lot of people who love the original tolerating this one and while tolerating is not the most praiseworthy word in the war in the world that's certainly a a high bar for most horror prequels and sequels especially to classics uh, i think it's well directed i think that there's some really good performances here primarily diane weist as many i thought she was fantastic there's some really good uh, directing and cinematography and choreography all at play whenever they do like these dream dance sequences. That's kind of the, the unique flavor they bring in here is like the Broadway style for the main character. But the problem with the film is that it's less of a prequel and more of a remake. It's almost the exact same plot. You have this character who we all know from the original film who basically goes through the same trials and the same path as Rosemary did in the original, 
where she is brought in, she is groomed and, you know, kind of looked over by the cast of Vats and other people that are, are residents of this Bramford building ends up being pregnant with the Antichrist and slowly has to figure all these things out. So it's very wash, rinse, repeat, but not done nearly as well as the original added in with the fact that it's a lead character that we already know her fate from the original film. So it takes all the tension, all the mystery and all the anticipation out of it because we know where things are going to lead. So it's a film that was much better than I thought. It's a film that I, I, I certainly enjoyed watching much more than I thought I would, but it's not a film that I think really merits its existence. I don't think it adds anything to this story or to this world or to the conversation of Rosemary's baby. It just kind of exists. Coming in at number 14 was the first secret screening of the festival, and that is Jason Reitman's Saturday Night. And this was basically a 90 minutes real time dramatization of the 90 minutes leading up to the airing of the first episode of Saturday Night Live in the 70s with the original cast. And while I think that there's a lot to like about this movie, and I could see a lot of people liking it way more than I did. There were really three main things that held it back for me. Number one, which is not this movie's fault, is that they decided to play it as the final film of the day. So it started at like 1130 p.m. And the type of experience this movie is going for is not the movie that you want to watch at 1130 at night after watching films all day in the Texas heat at a festival. So it's just, it was a little too chaotic and too rambunctious of a movie for the mood that I was in. If I had watched it earlier in the day, I think I would have liked it a little bit more. Uh, but then you have another two issues, one of which is that I really don't have any ties or built in knowledge of that era of Saturday Night Live. My era is the 90s. Adam Sandler, David Spade, Rob Schneider, Chris Farley, Will Ferrell. That is my version of Saturday Night Live. When I think Saturday Night Live, that is the cast and that is the era I think of. So I don't really have a whole lot of knowledge or a whole lot of emotion or fandom or nostalgia tied to Chevy Chase and John Belushi and, you know, um, Dan Aykroyd and that era. And if you do, you'll enjoy this more than I did, inevitably. And then the third issue is that this is a movie that is going more for an experience than it is a story. So this is a very chaotic movie. This is a very tumultuous movie where it is basically trying to do this real time dramatization from uh, the time that they are getting ready to go live and all of the multiple things that is going wrong from lights falling in set to actors having contract disputes and trying to walk off set to the execs trying to shut them down to, you know, not being able to figure out where they're going to put Billy Crystal and some other people on whether they need more lines or not. Like it's basically you following Lorne Michaels around through this studio and it never takes a breath. I mean, every single scene, there's something chaotic going on in the foreground as well as the background. And it just keeps that pace the entire time, which could be very intoxicating for some people. For me, it was just a bit exhausting. You're watching it and you just, you don't really have like this, narrative flow you don't really have this story that's being told more so as they're just trying to get you to experience the chaos that was and so there was a lot of things that i did like about it i think that there's a number of performances that are very uncanny and were, were brilliant and how well they captured people primarily the guy that was playing chevy chase uh, as well as the guy that was playing george carlin i thought those two were the best uh, you had another couple of good ones too like um Dylan O'Brien does a great job at doing early Dan Aykroyd. You also have somebody playing Billy Crystal that nailed his uh, his inflections of his voice and everything really well. There's a lot of other actors that I just didn't recognize because I'm not familiar with that era. Like I spent over half of the film saying, you know, this guy's not doing a very good Eddie Murphy impression. And it's not Eddie Murphy. <laughs> Spoiler alert. It's not Eddie Murphy at all. So this is a movie that I would like to check out again down the road when I'm in a, a better setting to check it out. Maybe I'll enjoy it a little bit more, but it inherently is the mo a type of movie that doesn't necessarily play well for me. You know, I like story and characters first. This is going just for an experience, the chaotic experience of the birth of one of the most iconic shows of all time. So depending on who you are, depending on your interest level and your ties to that era of Saturday Night Live, 
is going to depend entirely on how much you enjoy this film. Coming at number 13 is a movie called Daddy's Head, and I have described this film ever since seeing it as the Babadook for step parents. Now, those of you that hate the Babadook, it's usually because of the screaming, belligerent child. There's nothing like that in this movie. So if I compare it to the Babadook, don't let that scare you away if you're not a fan. It's just that type of story. You have a father and a husband that dies before the movie starts. And so you have this young child, this son, as well as this woman that he just married not too long ago, who's newly a step parent that are left to grieve. And while they are grieving and they're trying to figure out how to move on and, you know, the son's trying to figure out how to not have his father around the the woman is trying to figure out how to not have her husband around and whether or not she wants to step up for the responsibility of taking care of this kid or offload him onto somebody who's more more responsible and more driven to raise him. While all that is going on, you have this creature that starts to torment them that literally wears the face of the man that they just lost. So literally the title Daddy's Head, it's Daddy's Face. And so it's a movie that will, has some really good scares. It certainly has some interesting tension going on. Uh, I like what it ultimately stood for narratively, where you have uh, a step parent that has to rise to the occasion. You know, for those that don't know, I'm a father of three and the oldest two are not biologically mine. The father is not in the picture, never really was. So I'm the only father they've ever known. But that is a story that very much speaks to me. Somebody having to rise to the occasion and fill in a gap for a missing parent. And not everybody can do that. So uh, I liked what they were exploring here. I liked the the theme that they were exploring here. Um, ultimately, it's a movie that I, I, I think maybe have been a little bit overhyped for me. You know, this is one of two films that everybody was going nuts about. And so I watched this in the back half of the festival and uh, everybody was saying it terrified them and it scared them to death. And, you know, it, it wasn't on that level for me. I thought it was creepy. I thought it was effective. I liked what they were doing, but um I think I just I was expecting to be really unnerved and it didn't quite get there for me. But uh, this is one that I definitely enjoyed. And as I said, if you're somebody that loves the Babadook, you'll enjoy this. If you're somebody that didn't like the Babadook, I think you'll actually prefer this version of that type of story. Coming in at number 12 was the fourth secret screening of five, and that was Better Man. And when they revealed what this was, I think me and Anybody that knows me would have literally bet body parts that I would despise this movie. It was described as something that is so not my thing that it felt like I had no chance with this one. It is a musical biopic of a UK pop and cabaret star named Robbie Williams, who I personally have never heard of in my entire fucking life. Only... He is played in this movie by a CGI ape. Let me repeat that <laughs> so that you know I'm not bullshitting. Musical biopic of a UK pop star I've never heard of named Robbie Williams, but he is played by a CGI ape, a la Caesar from the Planet of the Apes films. When they announced that, I was like, holy fuck, this is the dog man of 2024. Like, should I leave? Like, the, I have no chance at liking this movie. Everything you just described sounds terrible to me. And this is one of those times when life humbles you and teaches you not to judge a book by its cover. Because I'll be damned, I actually enjoyed this movie. I don't know how the fuck I enjoyed it, but I actually enjoyed it. It is directed by the guy who brought us Greatest Showman, which I actually still have not seen because... As you guys know, I'm not a big musical guy, and so I just never really thought it would be my thing. But you have what honestly is a very uninteresting and cliche life. You know, no insult to Robbie Williams. Obviously, he has rose, risen to some form of superstardom, but the story itself, if I was to write down the plot beats, you'd be like, that's like every musical biopic I've ever seen. Oh, they get into fame early when they're young and they haven't matured yet. And then they get into drugs and debauchery and they turn into an asshole. And then by the end, they decide to be a good person. Yeah, I've seen and heard that story a dozen times. Why do I care? And that is kind of the story here. But somehow with the CGI ape element, which brings some weird form of sympathy where you actually like you kind of feel bad and you kind of are more sympathetic to this guy who's a complete asshole just because he's an ape. Um, as well as the style that the director brings and a lot of the more over the top 
nature of some of the sequences where like he's literally doing a concert, but he's also having like a, a battle within his consciousness. And you like have this Lord of the Rings style battle with a bunch of Robbie Williams apes. Uh, and so it, I, I, describing this movie, I swear you think I'm punking you, but this movie exists. It's coming out. You will be able to watch it. I couldn't look away almost like a car accident but I actually ended up kind of enjoying it for as dark as the story gets sometimes. And as much as he's such an unlikable character because of how he treats everybody from the get go, I shouldn't really enjoy his story, but somehow they found a way to make me endeared to it. They, they found a way to make me kind of root for his uh, becoming of a better man. There's a, an angle with his father that uh, really worked for me. There's a scene where you know he always had this close relationship with his grandmother, and he used to watch TV with her on the couch all the time. And there's a spot where after she's passed away, he literally gets an extension cord and brings a little TV and sits on her gravestone and watches TV. And as somebody that had a extremely close relationship with their grandmother who passed away a number of years ago, I was like, motherfucker, this goddamn monkey pop movie is not going to make me cry. It's not going to happen. Fuck, it's happening. So yeah, I mean... Keep an eye out for this one. You know, those of you that think there's no way you're going to like that, if you have the time to check it out, you might be surprised. Those of you that are extremely intrigued, it's a one of a kind experience. It was really interesting. So while when they introed it, I was like, fuck me. Like, no, do you have anything else I can walk into? I actually am glad that I got to see this. Uh, it was a nice little surprise. Number 11 is going to be Ick, and this was the standout horror comedy of the festival. This was one of the more just purely fun movies of the festival that uh, I had a good time with. So you essentially have like a twist on alien invasion mixed with like zombie apocalypse here. You have this extraterrestrial fungus plant that is taking over the earth slowly called the ick. That's what everybody refers it as. Like these little purple glowing roots are growing out of the ground and it's like growing over buildings, kind of like the last of us tendrils and things like that. And nobody really pays it any attention. It's just, it's always been there and they're not really that worried or bothered by it until one day it kind of becomes sentient. And all of a sudden now we have this alien invasion and this, uh, this parasitic zombie apocalypse style situation. And ultimately what the movie is really like commentating on and roasting is society's complacence and how society will continuously ignore glaring signs of trouble and glaring signs of danger. And so it's like 15 minutes into the movie before a character even acknowledges what this stuff is. Like you're watching this montage of the high school days of Brandon Routh and Mina Savari. And all throughout it, you're seeing this stuff on the ground that they're stepping on and it's in the background. And you're wondering the whole time, like, what is that shit? Like, why is nobody addressing that? And that's kind of the point of the movie. Uh, so it, it takes that as far as like roasting people's response to COVID and uh, like, like ultra woke new age people and stuff. So it's a movie that's having a lot of fun kind of pointing the finger and cracking jokes at everybody. Uh, people who over exaggerated and overreacted to things like that, as well as people that just didn't bother at all to follow any kind of uh, any kind of protocols. And so that side of it, I thought was pretty clever. The surface level story, which is just these goofy characters trying to survive this uh, alien invasion or whatever, I, I thought got less interesting as it went along. Uh, you have Brandon Routh here, who's a very funny actor, and you have Mina Savari and a few others that I've always liked, and uh, the situations that they're in as far as what their relationship was in high school versus now and how they compare and contrast was interesting. Uh, the biggest standout thing about this movie is the soundtrack, and they kind of presented it as that in the the pre-showing where the director and everybody comes out and kind of intros the film. And uh, if you're a fan of like late 90s, early 2000s pop, punk and radio rock like every needle drop in this film is just like a fuck yeah moment i mean you got things like stacy's mom and a bunch of other songs from that era and any movie that actually pauses to have a character go on a monologue about why creed is the greatest band that has ever ever walked the earth you have my support <laughs> so uh, i had a lot of fun with this one it doesn't completely come together it's not a complete win but I thought it was fun enough with what it was doing and it was clever enough with what it was talking about while having a very energetic soundtrack. So check this one out. It's a pretty good time. 
Kicking off the top 10, we have A Different Man, which is a A24 drama starring Sebastian Stan and Adam Pearson. And what this is essentially telling is a story of a man that has extreme facial deformities. He's got some kind of a condition where his face continuously produces tumors. And so he's a very insecure person. He's kind of a shell. He is ashamed of how he looks, and it makes him very skittish and very... Uh, nervous and insecure around other people, even if it's obvious that they like him. You know, he's trying to be an actor. He's trying to you know, go through life, and he just he, he's broken and crippled by his self-shame. So he undergoes this experimental treatment to try to get rid of some of the deformities, and miraculously, it heals all of them, and suddenly he looks like Sebastian Stan. And so now he has all these things that he's always wanted. He's got confidence. He's got good looks. He's got women. He's got a great career. And then he meets this man named Oswald, played by Adam Pearson, who is an actor who actually has these real life deformities, who has the same exact handicap that he used to have, the same exact deformities that he used to struggle with, only he's comfortable in his own skin, only he is happy with himself, he loves himself, he is, he's somebody who is very confident and, you know, very forthright, and he starts to have this very darkly comedic rivalry with this guy who is able to achieve all the things that he always wanted to achieve with all of the, the, the deformities that used to make him so cripplingly insecure where he could not achieve any of them. And aside from some really good performances and some really good makeup work on, on Sebastian Stan in the first section of the film, what I liked about this movie is what it stood for, is what it is telling you, what its ultimate message is, which is that life will reward you more times than not if you love yourself, if you're comfortable in your own skin, if you're confident, if you're forthright, and if you're somebody who is ashamed of themselves, if you hate yourself, if you're you know scared of what other people think of you and that's your main concern with life, more often than not, life will punish you for that. You know, you're never really going to get ahead. And so I just thought it was a really interesting and profound and darkly comedic way to explore that. So it's not necessarily a movie that I think I would rewatch very often, maybe ever. Uh, but for a single watch type movie, I thought it had a lot to say. I thought that it was it was very interesting. So I encourage you to check it out if what the movie stands for interests you, which it should. It's a very important message, I think. Coming in at number nine is going to be Night Call, and this is a French thriller, and what it is is you have the main character who is a locksmith, and he is commissioned, he is hired to unlock this apartment door, and unbeknownst to him, it's by somebody that does not live there, and once the door is opened, they steal money out of this apartment, which belongs to somebody with criminal element ties. And so suddenly this locksmith is snatched up by this criminal element and is put in a situation where he has to himself go retrieve the money that he allowed this person to steal. Otherwise, they're going to kill him. And all the while, somebody within this criminal element that set up this heist is trying to kill him so that they don't ultimately find out that he was a traitor. So it is very much a cat and mouse game. It's a very tense thriller. And I Highly enjoyed this film to where it would have been probably in my top six all the way up until like the last seven, eight minutes of the film. I think that the performances are really good. I think it maintains a lot of tension. I think that uh, it's an interesting little concept there, you know, taking a situation and putting a locksmith in there where he actually has to use his skills to kind of get out of a few situations throughout it. There's literally like a suit up scene that made me laugh out loud where he's getting all of his locksmith garb on and his trench coat and the little reflectors and his little toolbox. I don't think they were going for a laugh, but it was almost like a parody of Arnold suiting up in the third act of Commando putting on the vest and the grenades and the camo. It was like that, but with fucking uh, locksmith shit. So I, I got a good laugh out of that. But where the movie lost me a bit is that it is set in the backdrop of the Black Lives Matter riots in France. And at first, I really liked how they were doing that because it was just kind of the background. And there's a spot in the movie where the main character actually uses those protests and riots to his advantage to get through a situation. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That's well written, kind of having to use that situation for a plot device. But then out of nowhere, 
in the final act of the film without saying what happens, it goes from using that as a backdrop to overtly trying to make that like the message of the film by the end of it, which just felt so out of nowhere and shoehorned in and on the nose and overt that it kind of turned me off at the end of it. Like I didn't hate it. Obviously it's still pretty high on this list, but it would have been a good four, maybe even five spots higher if it had ended better. And it just kind of felt like, they had this movie that was this for the entire runtime, and then out of nowhere, they tried to make it this, and it just doesn't work, and it, 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 it almost does the opposite of whatever kind of commentary they were trying to make with those implications at the end of it, and it's like, a, it doesn't work if you don't set that up, if you don't let us know we're in that type of movie, if you don't build towards that. You can't just do a hard left turn and suddenly make this what your movie is about without it being extreme turn off. And so you're left kind of bewildered and confused and not really satisfied by the end of it because it feels like you got the ending to a movie that you weren't watching. Coming in at number eight is Strange Harvest, a cult murder in the Inland Empire. Very long title. And that was honestly what kind of intrigued me to this movie. And this is a fake true crime documentary that is kind of in the style of the Zodiac killer with a bit of a supernatural twist. So you're watching this film and the whole time it's played as a regular real life documentary where you're giving testimonials from the investigating officers and the victims and the survivors and they're splicing in news footage and some footage that was found by CCTVs or from laptops. And it's compiling and telling the story of these increasingly uh, sinister murders of this killer named Mr. Shiny in just outside of LA. And what was so impressive about this movie is that at no point aside from when some of the supernatural elements start to bleed into it, does it ever give you any kind of an inclination that this is not a real life event? I guarantee if you set most people down and played this movie, it would take most of the runtime before they started to ask questions of whether or not this is real or not. Most people would be like, I've never heard of this sick fuck. What? Where, Mr. Shiny, when did this happen? And it's also a testament to how good the performances here are because you really don't have actors playing like a typical movie character. They're trying to play real life people. They're trying to play how real life detectives, real life victims and survivors would act on a documentary where they're being interviewed about shit that is so darkly in their past from like a decade ago and everybody does a really good, convincing job. And so I obviously knew this was a, a fake documentary when I started watching it. But if you didn't tell me that, it would take me a while to catch on to that. And that's kind of the brilliance of what they're going for here. Like, I've watched a number of these style documentaries with my wife, whether it's been, you know, the one on Richard Ramirez or whatever from a year ago. And like, they, this is very much crafted in the way of mimicking that type of experience with a fictional narrative, a fictional kel uh, killer and a fictional series of killings and events. And so it was a really neat experience. You know, this is something that I think if you're into true crime documentaries, and even though I would not call this a found footage horror film, the nature of a lot of the, the killings and the footage that are being used here is in the found footage format. If you're a fan of that, I think you'll dig this. So if you want something that's kind of in the vein of the Zodiac killer, but something that's a little more supernatural and just watching how a filmmaker and actors can very effectively recreate real life with a fictional narrative. Check this one out. It was pretty neat. Coming in at number seven was the closing film of the festival, and that is Mr. Crockett. And this debuts on Hulu in uh, like less than a week. I think it's on the 11th. So a week from today when I'm recording this. And this is basically Freddy Krueger mixed with Mr. Rogers. You have this man, Mr. Crockett, on this VHS tape, like this old school 80s or 90s children's television program where he's dancing around with puppets and singing these like very terrible yet somehow catchy songs. And the horror twist is that if these kids are watching Mr. Crockett and Mr. Crockett sees the parents behaving badly, you know, punishing the kids undeservedly or being overbearing or being abusive in any way. He comes out of the TV, brutally murders the parent and takes the children to his world, which is like a happier world. 
So again, very Nightmare on Elm Street inspired, uh, almost to a fault. I would almost say it's a little too uh, inspired by Nightmare on Elm Street. As a big Freddy fan, I feel like it leaned a little too hard onto that. But at the same time, I, I, I love Freddy, so I, I don't completely mind that. Uh, but what really worked about this one is not only the concept, but like the performance and the, the way that they craft the character of Mr. Crockett. He's like that perfect mix of creepy and uh, very uh, unnervingly g uh, genuine to what a lot of those hosts, <laughs> you know, Pee Wee Herman and uh, you know, all the people on, on the old children's TV programs are. And I really like the puppetry work here and the, the practical work with some of these creature designs with like the. You, you have all of the puppets and the animals and the characters of the TV show. And then whenever you're actually in Mr. Crockett's world, it's like the demented version of that. They suddenly go from cute and cuddly to like sadistic and, you know, fang toothed and everything. And so I thought that that was really fun. And so it's a movie that I think most people will have a really good time, especially watching during October, during spooky season. What held the movie back from being in like my top five is that they needed to work on the script quite a bit. There is a lot of contrivance and convenience here. They had a great concept. They had some great set pieces for kills, but they had some struggle at kind of stringing all that together in a narrative that feels like it has flow. Like there's literally a point where we need to have the characters learn some type of information to get them from A to B. And rather than find some very natural, organic way to do that, we just have one of the characters suddenly have psychic powers where they can look at a TV and get this information. And so you have like moments like that where it's like, oh, you kind of cheated there. So I had a good time with this one. I hope it's successful enough where we get like a Mr. Crockett Returns because this is actually a franchise that I would like to see continue. It's a character that I would like to see continue, especially if you're a Nightmare on Elm Street fan like I am. I think you're going to enjoy where this goes and kind of taking that as inspiration and making its own thing with it. So I had fun with Mr. Crockett. Number six is Never Let Go. And I feel like I'm one of the few people that actually really like this movie. I, I haven't seen too much praise for it. And this was one of the opening films. This is the one that was directed by Alexander Ja and stars Halle Berry, where she's this mother who has her two boys in this house, this cabin that's secluded in the woods. And she has raised them with this belief that there is this evil entity out in the wilderness. And as long as they are in their house or they're tethered to their house with this rope, if they need to go out for supplies or food, then they're safe. But if they let go, if they sever themselves from their house, then they are susceptible to being taken over by this entity. And I want to know what about this story or this character drew you back to horror? Well, I mean, this was what an amazing script. Like I, I hadn't read a script like this before. And so it was fresh. It captured my imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, I had never seen a family in this. I was determined to sort of figure out what would this world be like, like and bring all the details to it, like and do all that kind of work. Um, and I always love a character where I get to disappear into it. You know, I get to be so far from myself, and those are the, that's the work I love, and those are the, that's the most exciting, um, you know, experiences for me. And then to work with Alex Aja, I mean, this was a different kind of film for him too, so we both got to do something different together, you know, and we were very united in that goal. I think that Alexander Ajad does a good job at visualizing that and visualizing the different apparitions and the things that the characters see and the sound design when they hear things. I think the three central performances are really good. Uh, and what I liked about the movie the most is that it very carefully gives you a little information without giving you too much with basically all of the elements of this film where it leaves it up to interpretation in quite a few different ways. I have heard people describe what they think this movie is about, about seven or eight different ways. And I think that's very interesting. I think when you have a film like this that we can all watch and you have one of us that thinks it's just, you know, you could just take it at face value. It's just a movie about this evil entity and a mother trying to protect them. You have another person that feels like it's a commentary on COVID regulations. You have another person that thinks that it's a allegory for racism. You have another person that feels like it is an allegory for uh, the, the parenting and how some of your bad habits and some of your demons and some of your skeletons in the closet can sometimes bleed into your children through your upbringing. And like, it was a really interesting movie to discuss. And we don't get that very often. Most movies don't feel like they merit 
a lot of discussion aside from just very base level what I like and what I didn't like. A movie like this where we can all sit around and debate and compare and contrast notes with what we got out of the film, I think that's very interesting. So it, there is a bit of a having your cake and eat it too element where I think a lot of people, which is why most people seemingly didn't care for this, they need a lot more explanation. They need this to be a little more clean with what it's saying. And I understand that more times than not, I'm the person saying that. But for whatever reason, the way that they attack this story in this film, I liked how open-ended it was. I liked how uh, susceptible to interpretation it was. So I look forward to checking this out again at some time soon. Coming in at number five was a nice little surprise, and that is The Wild Robot. Now, again, it's weird on this list for a myriad of reasons. First of all, you have all these dark, depraved, fucked up and weird movies, and then you've got a DreamWorks animated movie thrown in there. And of all of them, this is the one that's like the most mainstream studio based that doesn't really feel like it belongs in a Fantastic Fest list. And so when they first announced that it was going to be premiering there, I was like, that's kind of weird. Like, I don't know, I don't know if I'm going to attend that or not. And I'm kind of glad that I did because it's a movie that I probably would not have went to the theaters to see just because I'm not really that big into animation anymore. And it was a really good touching story. You have this robot that is basically built to just take on tasks for humans. It's like Alexa with legs. And uh, it crash lands on this wilderness planet that is just nothing but, you know, trees and nature and wild animals. And it's about this robot struggling to find her purpose like she doesn't know how to fulfill her purpose because nobody needs her to fulfill these mundane tasks and she finds purpose in finding this goose egg that hatches and so this baby goose that doesn't have any parents and doesn't have anybody to teach it how to become a goose how to fly how to eat how to survive how to create shelter and so it's very much a story about slipping into the role of motherhood and what it means to be a parent, what love is, you know, is family just about blood or about the people that love you and take care of you? Also finding your way to, to find your place in society because the robot is very much rejected by all of the animals. And then eventually they find a place for her and she, she, she earns her way in. And so it was just a lot of really sweet and touching things that are explored in this movie with great animation, great uh, voice acting. And so I, I really enjoyed this one. I, I wish that I could spend more time and give you just one more lesser known film than to promote something by DreamWorks that doesn't need my help promoting it. Certainly doesn't need Fantastic Fest help promoting it, but it played. I watched it. I loved it. It's this high on the list. Coming in at number four, you have Bone Lake. And this was the movie that most people were highly buzzing about for most of the festival. So I caught this in the back half after everybody had talked it up. And I highly enjoyed this one. And the way that I described this whenever I did my little blurb on Twitter is that Bone Lake is like speak no evil if you gave it an orgasm. <laughs> you have these two couples that end up at this Airbnb on Bone Lake and they have been double booked. And so they decide, hey, you seem cool enough. You seem trustworthy enough. Let's just share this property for the weekend and have a good time. And which starts really, you know, fun for everybody, slowly starts to get uncomfortable because one of the two couples is a bit more sexually aggressive. And so in the vein of Speak No Evil, where you have two vacationing couples and one is consistently violating like social etiquettes and is being very forward and uncomfortable with the things that they're bringing up and saying, it's very much in that vein, but much more erotic. And so it's a film that you're very much like on the edge of your seat and you're tense, waiting to see if somebody's going to bite. Like, is this husband going to end up sleeping with this wife or vice versa? Like, is somebody going to crack? Is somebody going to violate their marriage? What exactly are they trying to do here? Are we going to end up in some weird orgy scene by the end of it? Like, where is this thing going? And uh, I'm not going to tell you where things go, but things go in some wild directions. And uh, they get pretty gnarly and crazy out of nowhere, too, by the third act. So, uh this is a movie that was very entertaining. It was very funny. There's a number of moments where just the way somebody says something got a huge uproar of laughter in my theater. So if you are interested in that premise, uh, if you like movies like Speak No Evil, but you want to have maybe a little bit more fun with that type of premise versus uh, 
being angry and pissed off and depraved like the especially the original speak no evil wants you to feel uh, then I recommend checking this out. I had a good time with this one. Now we are at our top three, the Titans of Fantastic Fest 2024. And coming at number three is going to be Terrifier 3. Now, this was my most anticipated of the festival. Uh, this was the one film that I absolutely had to see come hell or high water of this festival. And I had a really good time with it. It delivered everything that I wanted from it. Now, I was not a massive fan of the first Terrifier, but when I walked into Terrifier 2 with, you know, not many expectations and I walked out going, holy shit, that was a lot of fun, became a fan of this franchise and I've been highly looking forward to this third film and wondering where they were going to take things, how they're going to top the second film, where they're going to go as far as answering all these wild questions that they've brought up about lore and the origins of art and this entity that resurrected him and the nature of Sienna and the mystery of her father. So many lingering questions that I was curious how much of that we were going to get answered here. And then you have the fun little detail of this being a Christmas horror film. And for me, this was exactly what I wanted as a follow-up to Terrifier 2. Uh, they intentionally kind of go back a bit to more the tone and the look and the approach of the first film somewhat, while very much holding on to the vibe of the second film and with like the over the top lore and the fantastical elements and having the character of Sienna and everything like that. So I, I was initially a little nervous of how far they were going to go back. And I think they found that perfect mix. See you, man. Well, good to see you, man. So similar along the lines, what you just asked, but okay. with two, I was genuinely surprised at like a lot of the, the insertion of lore and the different tonal shifts and having a lot more of like a, a dark, funny edge to it. So what tonal shifts or what new changes and elements can we expect for the third one? I actually went back more tonally to the tone of part one and the atmosphere of part one. Because I feel like part two was sort of my dream warriors where it became more poppy and more fantastic, especially with the fantasy element. But I didn't want to make that mistake of now going too far in that direction. I wanted to reel it in and go back to what everybody sort of liked about art in the first place, which, which was that grittier grindhouse vibe. So this may be the most, the darkest and most disturbing one, believe it or not, but it still very much has the tone of part two, just the bigger scope, and we're following, obviously, Sienna and the lore that we set up. So I think it, it's the perfect blend, the perfect marriage of one and two. Okay. So what I'm hearing is you made Dream Warriors, but we don't want to head towards Freddy's Dead. Correct. <laughs> yeah, I want to go back to Nightmare on Elm Street, the original now, if I can. Yeah, awesome, yeah. man. <laughs> we'll be there at 11. I can't wait to see you. Uh, thanks, right. bro. I hope no you enjoy problem. it. Thanks. Having that grindhouse, that darkness, that mean streak, but also maintaining a lot of the craziness that a lot of us fell in love with with the second film, the kills continue to get more extravagant. There's more kills in this movie than the other two films for sure. And each individual kill feels like it's its own set piece. There's not a whole lot of cannon fodder in this movie. Each person that dies, there's an extravagant death scene there. So uh, the makeup work and the special effects continue to be top notch and just the perfect amount of stomach churning, real looking uh, grossness. You have uh, everybody involved performance wise continues to do great. David Howard Thornton continues to find these sick, charming little ways to bring Art the Clown's uh, brand of twisted humor to life. You have Lauren Lavera that's bringing a much more unhinged element to Sienna in this movie. You know, she's kind of out for blood. She's got a vengeful streak to her. And I think that it brings a really nice element to kind of evolve her character and carry her story story forward. What are one or a couple of your favorite final girls and how did that character or that performance kind of influence your second chapter? To see you? um, oh my God, how, how, how does my favorite final girl influence? Yeah, because you're kind of in that like yeah. survivor's guilt chapter, I assume, for I'd the say third so. one. So that, that's kind so. of a common thing. So is there yeah. any character, Lori Strode or you know anybody like that that I mean, influenced how you took it? There's really so many. Like there's definitely not one and even Sienna is a culmination of so many final girls that I love like Lori, Sydney, Ripley is a big one and one of my favorites that we didn't really discuss Damien and I um, is Mia Allen from the Evil Dead franchise and she definitely goes through a lot of guilt. She goes through a lot in that in the 2013 movie um, and I'd say they all influenced especially probably Mia the most because she she's a bit unhinged in that movie and I, and I get to be a bit unhinged.
unhinged in here. So I'm very excited about that, and hopefully it translated well. <laughs> we'll see. I love that yeah. movie, so I'll be able to see if it's there. Yeah, not. yeah, you'll have to let me know. Very you'll have cool. to give me your honest opinion. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll be there at 11, so we'll, hopefully we'll see you after the movie and talk yeah. a little bit more. Yeah, we'll see what happens. It's kind of a long time until then, so mm -hmm. let's hope we can all chill. Yes, that'd be awesome. Yeah, 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 Very for cool. sure. All right. And you know, this is a movie that you know it, it really rides the line of maybe doing too much. For some people, it might do too much, even the most devout Terrifier fans. But I think they really wisely found a way to push the envelope and cross boundaries without going into a place where it's just going to be an immediate turnoff for a lot of people. The way that they were creative about what they showed versus what they implied and what you are just suggested is happening to where even the most taboo of things that they do in this film, they do it in a way that's palatable. They do it in a way that is not just immediately too far and too shocking and too much where it's just going to kind of ruin the fun element of the movie, which is a, a very hard tightrope to walk. So I had a great time with this one. If you're a fan of the Terrifier movies, I have a hard time believing that there's going to be very many of you that are not going to be very happy with this third film. Number two was easily the biggest surprise of the festival and was my number one for the majority of the festival, and that is Honora. And this is a movie that was certainly on my radar. I wouldn't say it was a movie I was dying to see, but I had heard some buzz about it. I think it played at Cannes Festival, and it was it got an award there, and I had seen bits of the trailer getting shared around on Twitter, a lot of Mikey Madison fans sharing it around, but all I really knew about it was that it was some form of Cinderella story for sex workers. And so certainly an intriguing premise, and so we walked into this one, and for the first 40 minutes or so, that's exactly what it is. You have Mikey Madison, who you guys will recognize as one of the two ghost faces in Scream 5, and she is a stripper and a escort. And she basically starts this fling with this rich Russian kid who just kind of wants to use her for like the girlfriend experience and like a, a party partner for a couple of weeks. And so for 45 minutes, it's just these two partying and fucking over and over and over again, which was a bit awkward for me to watch sitting next to Uncle Sean because I was the one that picked this movie. And then I just for like the first act and a half, I'm like, it really doesn't feel like it's going anywhere narratively. It's just a bunch of sex, drugs and rock and roll. And so I'm just sitting there like this. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh. But you get to the point of the film where, you know, she is addicted to his high life lifestyle and he wants to have citizenship in America. So they go off to Vegas and they get married. Hence like the Cinderella story. Cause now she's somebody who is stripping and now she's like got mink coats and a mansion and shit. Once that point of the film comes, it takes a hard turn tonally where this kid's family is implied to be like really powerful, maybe like mob ties and they take extreme issue with the fact that he has married a prostitute. And so you get these goons, these, you know, <laughs> these criminal workers that work for his parents that come to their house and are going to force them to get an annulment. And the rich Russian kid, the husband, hauls ass. So the rest of the hour and a half of the film is Mikey Madison's character, Honora, stuck with these goons trying to hunt this kid down and figure out where he's at so they can get this marriage annulled. And it is fucking hilarious. It is one of the funniest movies that I have seen in a very long time. It is right up there with Deadpool and Wolverine for me as funniest film of 2024. I mean, me and the entire theater were laughing over and over and over again. And they're really clever, well-crafted, funny moments. Like, it's not slapstick. It's not low-hanging fruit. It's just situational humor. It's the, the way that the dialogue comes through with the performances. It was such an enjoyable movie that finds ways to still surprise you with these very emotional, dramatic, and gut-punch moments by the end. So it's a film that just takes you on a wild ride where you're just in debauchery and then suddenly you're laughing your ass off and then suddenly you want to cry. Suddenly you're like, oh my God, the devastation of all of this just hit me. 
Mikey Madison goes for it. And for uh, an actress that I have obviously seen, I think she was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, of course, Scream 5. This is the movie that's going to put her on the map. Like, she is absolutely a lock for Best Actress nomination, if not the win. She is fantastic. And so this is a movie that, like, when I saw it, I was like, holy shit. Like, that's easily the best film that I've seen at this festival. And it stayed as number one for a very long time up until what ended up being my number one. But this is the movie that I encourage all of you that's kind of a, a, a lesser-known movie that's one of the more smaller independent films to put on your radar because, damn, it was good. And finally, we have my number one of Fantastic Fest 2024, which was the third secret screening of five, and that was Heretic. Now, I had an inkling that this was going to be something good because actually on like day one or day two of the festival, the PR company, Fonz PR, actually emailed me and asked me directly, hey, do you want a press pass to the secret screening three? You don't even have to bother with the ticketing. And they only do that if they really want this person specifically to cover this film. So number one, I figured it was probably horror. And number two, I got my hopes up really high of what this could be because this was the only secret screen that they were doing that type of treatment for. So you walk in and I was a little bit bummed because Uncle Sean could not get entrance into this. So that kind of soured my experience a little bit, which I talked about at the beginning of this with the ticketing system. I really wish he could have been in the theater with me because I'm pretty positive this would have been in his top two, maybe his number one as well. Uh, a lot of people that I went there with, this ended up being their number one of the festival. But Heretic is a movie that was on my radar. I was interested in it. I saw the trailer, which I usually don't watch trailers, but this is one that intrigued me. And I just you know got captivated by it in the theater and didn't walk out and leave like I normally do. Uh, and so you have Hugh Grant, who is playing this man that lives in this kind of isolated house. And these two Mormon missionary girls show up because he's requested some more information about their religion. And so after he invites them in, Suddenly they realize that they are locked in this house and he is playing this mind game with them where he's essentially trying to shake their faith. He is giving arguments and factual historical evidence and anecdotes to try to get them to question the validity of their religion and get them to shake their faith. And they progress through this game, if you will, based on whether or not they still believe or they starting to lose belief. And what I loved about this movie is that it is very rare that you find a religious horror film that is so smartly written. Because as somebody who's not overtly religious or, you know, some a person of faith, I do have a lot of family and a lot of friends that are. And so I myself still find myself getting offended sometimes whenever I see a film that is just overtly mocking religion or faith or is, you know, making a mockery of it, or trying to shit on it in some way, or take it down in a very superficial way without any actual intelligent conversation. And what this movie does is it pre presents a lot of very captivating arguments against religion and against the origins of religions, while at the same time putting just as much energy into the power of faith and the power of belief. And so it's a movie that is very balanced and at no point does it ever slip into sacrilege in my opinion. And it keeps that tension going and it keeps it so captivating because they're able to walk that very thin tightrope and never devolve into mockery of people of faith. And so you're always invested in these two girls journey yet. You're always captivated by Hugh Grant's awesome performance and he's also very uniquely a villain because he's always jovial and he's always kind of uh, charming and fun. He never really gets too sinister or too overtly antagonistic with his, with his performance. And so just from start to finish, I thought this movie was basically flawless. The only thing by the end of it that I had, which was almost a nitpick at that point for how great the experience was, is that when, by the time the third act comes and you start to get some answers about what ultimately is going on here, what his ultimate goal is, what this game is, how long he's been doing it, how long he wants to do it, everything like that, there's a few too many questions left unanswered that uh, I needed a little bit more details on to, to fit the pieces together cleanly. There's just a few things that happen where I'm like... I. How did that happen? How did you do that? I need to know just a little bit more. 
But I, I mean, I struggled to not give this a five out of five. And that's very rare for me. I've only done that once with a new release in the eight years that I've been on YouTube. And this was damn near the second time. But after I sat on it and I slept on it, that did bug me ever so slightly. So it was like the one little tiny chink in the armor of how brilliant this movie is. But that notwithstanding, and in a rewatch, I might even throw that out. Maybe I'll get that answer on a rewatch. This was just a brilliant film, an absolutely brilliant religious horror movie. I think that it's easily one of the best films, not just horror films, best films of the year. It shot up easily into my top three, might even get higher towards like my top two by the end of the year. Once I rewatch it, I absolutely loved Heretic. And when it comes out in November, highly encourage all of you to check it out because it is damn good. Well, that is it, guys. That is my ranking of Fantastic Fest 2024. Please let me know which of these 25 films you are interested in. Go check out Uncle Sean's video to see his ranking, how it contrasts and compares to mine. Like, share, hit that subscribe button if you have not already. I'll put a playlist of my 2024 release reviews as well as the Fantastic Fest films that I did do full reviews for up here. And as always, please remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.